It says it's recording. Okay, recorded. Okay, welcome Year 12s. Uh, welcome to the students that we've been teaching for the past five years and also welcome to those students that are going to be joining us next year. We're really, really excited to see you. Um, we thought we'd do a uh, Zoom like this and download it for you. That way you get to actually see us. Um, those of you that know us, hopefully, I know everyone, that's hopefully it's nice for you to see us. For those um, people that are new, hopefully you get to know what we look like. So on the first day, you will know who to expect when you walk into the room. So um, we're not the best at IT. I am going to start to share screen. Yay. So first things first, uh, my name is Mrs. Davis. And this is Mrs. Wilkes. Um, we are going to go through, first of all, hopefully, if my slideshow works, uh, we're going to go through just a few things initially with you, and then uh, we will break the, su the subject down and we will both talk about our little modules that we do. So, physical education the fact that you picked that means that you love your sport um, and means that you're really ready and willing to take on a really tough subject, but a subject that's really good fun. Um, just a quick reminder to you, you do know hopefully quite a lot of this already, but um, it's OCR exam board. Uh, for those of you that want to research it, it's the H55 syllabus, the H555 syllabus. Um, theory is 70% and there's three modules. Uh, there's an exam at the end of each of those modules. So there's an exam in physiology, social cultural studies and skill acquisition and psychology. Um, there's 30% practical. Within that 30% practical, actually only half of that is really practical. That is your one sport. So 15% towards your one sport, and then 15% towards a speech that you do on that sport in relation to all of the theory that you've learned throughout the year. Um, what will your lessons look like? Again, hopefully quite a lot of you know this already. Uh, you're going to have 10 lessons a fortnight. Five of your lessons are going to be in physiology with me. And then three lessons are going to be on skill acquisition with Mrs. Wilkes, and two lessons are going to be social cultural with Mrs. Wilkes. So you both, so you see both of us for five lessons a fortnight. Um, all lessons are theory based. Um, in Mrs. Wilkes' lessons, in particular, you may well do the odd um, practical, learning the theory through the practical, but they are pretty much theory based. Um, our expectations for those of you that know us well will know that we do have very high expectations. Our lessons are going to be really clear, really structured. It's going to be based on mutual respect. Hopefully, we're going to have loads and loads of fun. But as I say, anyone we say, um, it's going to be really structured, and hopefully, you will have lots of fun and enjoy and learn lots of well. Okay, the first thing I just want to talk to you about is um, that one sport that you have to do for A level PE. Um, hopefully, you have looked at this already and maybe discussed this with us on the uh, sixth form open evening. It's really important that you are highly involved in a sport and a sport that is on the curriculum. Okay, mm -hmm. that must that should mean that you are doing that week in, week out, day in, day out for some of you. You should be training and participating as much as you possibly can. And when you are doing those uh, competitions, whether they be matches or races or whatever it is, um, you need to be filming those because you need to have evidence. Uh, half a year into year 13, like a DVD montage of all of your best bits. A lot of our students actually really enjoy making this. Um, it's a bit of an ego trip for them. Uh, they quite enjoy um, putting all their best bits together and coming up with a really good montage to send off to the examiners. I just want to show you um, the different sports that you can do. Hopefully, it's going to work. So just loading it up. So these are the sports that you can do. This is the first page. So if you just have a look down there, just to triple check that your sport is on there. I'll just give you five more seconds on this page before I move on to the next page. So just triple check that it is on there. In previous years, we've had people that have started and then it's and then they've realised a couple of weeks into it that their sport's not been on it, and then they've had a really hard decision to make. Um, so please make sure that your sport is on there. If it's not on there, um, maybe give us an email so you can have a chat with us. So then we can discuss the um, movement forwards for you. But ideally, you should be doing one of those sports on the specification a great deal. Just get back to PowerPoint. Okay. 
Okay, finally, uh, you can take time to look at this specification as well that was broken down into all the different topics of what you will cover over the course of the year and a half to two years before your exam. Okay, so um, social culture studies is worth 28 cents of the course. It's a one hour exam and you're going to be doing two hours of fortnight of this with Mrs. Brooks. So without further ado, I will pass on to Mrs. Brooks. So the sociocultural side um, looks at quite a lot of history of sport. Um, and then we, as you would have noticed if you've look at this, looked at the spec, when we move into um, the Olympics and the history of the Olympics, and then things like the impact of media, globalisation, commercialisation on sport now, we do a little bit of data as well. But I think it's really important that you are aware <clears throat> of the impact and you um, know the impact of sport on just our society. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the fact that actually sport back in the day helped um, people to uh, prepare the population for war, to hunt for food and to improve fitness for work. And it's also been used as a tool to bring communities together on holy days and festivals. If you think about um, the Boxing Day fox hunting, that has massive roots um, in history. Um, if you think about Shrove Tuesdays, not just about pancakes, but there is a big sport um, uh, link uh, with that as well. So there are various different ways that actually sport has influenced the society that we live in today, not just necessarily playing and participating in sport, but the history behind it. Um, okay. um, what we look at in particular is um, how the sport has been um, in, impacted by either your class or your gender. So we don't really look individually at, okay, this is football, let's look back at the, the, the uh, grassroots of football and then look at the um, formalization of the um, FA, et cetera, et cetera. But we look more in terms of the class system that you would have been in, sort of pre-1950s Britain, and then whether gender actually impacted on the sports that you um, would have participated in. So, for example, next slide, I don't know if I can do that, okay. Uh, just having a look at social class. So we have a look at actually what does it mean? So it's, you know, I'm not gonna read this all out to you, but you can see it's a group defined by status within a community or population. And it was determined by lots of different factors, which you can see in the middle of that screen. It wasn't necessarily just about money that you had as a family, but there were lots of other factors that came into it. Um, and in Britain, we're not talking about America or anywhere else in, in the world. We're looking, focusing on Britain for this section. And we look at three different classes, upper, middle and lower. To be honest, we don't spend much time looking at middle, middle but we do at the upper and lower classes. And then on the next slide, you'll see that we focus here on two different um, classes. So the, the, the upper class, and they were, if you look at the top, uh, top left-hand side of the screen, the aristocracy and the gentry, um, and they were the landowners, but a lot of the time that was hereditary. So it came down through families. Um, they had the money, they had the time, um, and they also had the societal status as well. So they would participate in things like your fox hunting, which I just talked about. Um, there were lots of different rules and etiquette associated with that. Um, we're gonna look in a second about something called pedestrianism. Um, and actually they had the ability to travel to different, um, well, they weren't competitions, festivals, et cetera, et cetera. In contrast, we look at the lower class and how that impacted their participation or uh, in sport. And so mainly they were the people that worked on the land. They were employed very often by the upper classes. Um, they didn't really participate in many sports or um, activities and recreations because they didn't have the money, they didn't have the equipment, there wasn't the facilities. So things that they participated in were mob football, which some of you may have heard of before. Um, and then, you know, not necessarily very politically correct activities now, things like your dog fighting, prize fighting. Um, but back in those times, they, they were big events. There were not really any rules because they couldn't read or write very well. They're quite uncivilized. Um, and there wasn't necessarily a lack of opportunity to travel because they didn't have the transport. So everything was very localized in what they were doing. So this leads on to your first task. 
Um, and what I want you to do is actually have a look at real tennis. Now, real tennis, you'll notice, was on the previous slide, and that was something that the upper classes participated in. Um, I want you to do something that is two sides of A4. You must include the information that is listed below. So um, you need an outline of how the game was formed, so the roots behind it, key dates, places, the aim of the game, um, characteristics of the game, including the venue and the equipment, who was it played by. Um, and this will be a really good opportunity for you to have a look on things like Google Image um, and other places you can get photographs from, because you'll notice straight away the difference between real tennis as it was back then compared to tennis now. So be aware when you're looking at rules and places and venues and things like that, just make sure that the rules you're looking at are the rules for pre-1850s um, and not now, because they may be slightly different. So that's two sides of A4, um, and that's your, your task based on this topic. And then your summer task, things on the next slide, um, we're gonna look at pedestrianism which I've already mentioned. And actually, this is quite a unique activity um, along with cricket because they, was, they were two sports that weren't necessarily uh, categorised in terms of the class that you were in. Um, so as you can see, there were two activity sports where social class did not cause participation barriers. These were pedestrianism and cricket. And your task for the summer is to create another case study because we will spend quite a bit of time at the start of this course looking at case studies and sports um, to enable us to get all the, the information that we need. Uh, you're going to title it Sports for Both and you're going to research and present your information on both. Again, a minimum of two sides of A4 and use the points below as guidance. So a brief description. I don't want a page and a half of um, uh, an essay on what it was. You know, very, very brief, maybe just the key points. Again, with cricket, remember that it's the, uh, the pre-1850s game, not the current game now. So just be aware if there are differences in any rules. And please include photographs and diagrams. That will be particularly important um, for pedestrianism um, because there should be and there are lots of photographs that you could use. Um, I want to know when, where and how it was originated and how the participants were linked to each of the different classes. So um, there is a relationship between the upper and lower classes, particularly in pedestrianism. So who was it that was participating and who was it that was perhaps organising? a bit of a clue there. Additional key words that I uh, would like you to include. I want you to, to know about the bat and ball in, um, the place that's called Hambledon, uh, wagering, footman, the pub, because the pub is quite significant in one of these sports. Um, and then one of them has a real link to cross country and it might be quite obvious, but you know, perhaps a paragraph about how that you might see that linking into a sport now. Again, lots of photographs, lots of pictures and lots of colors. So this is, you know, two research tasks for you to do. Um, I you should find them interesting. I think you'll find them interesting and then they'll be a you'll be able to um, link almost those sports into how they've, how they've diverged across the years to the present day. <clears throat> so that's, that's your socio-cultural. I don't know, oh, straighten them to me again. <coughs> Excuse me. So skill acquisition, um, and then this leads into sports psychology. This is 28% of the course as well, and is again another one hour examination. Now this is three hours a fortnight, so we have a little bit more time on this one because there's slightly more content to it. Um, on the, one of the first topics that we'll look at is transfer of skill, um, but we might look at that, maybe not in the first lesson, but perhaps the second or third weeks. Um, now, a skill acquisition is about how we learn and develop movement skills, and the GCSE course that you, you've just finished, you will have done topics on skill classification, where you're looking at things like open skills, closed skills, discrete skills, etc, etc. And actually, we recap that at the very start of the A-level course, so please don't forget that. It might actually be beneficial for you to bring your GCSE um, exercise book with you to this first lesson, because so much of it is the same and we'll be re re recapping and adding a little bit more detail but this is kind of the first big topic that we do and this looks at actually how we can transfer skills so when you're in primary school and you learn fundamental skills of things like throwing jumping running and um, all of those skills create the basis for everything that you do now in your sport so for example if you're a jabbing thrower 
if you think back to your primary school um, PE lessons, you probably stood on a field maybe when you were in year five with a tennis ball or with one of those aero balls and you would have just thrown them. And the action of that actually then links into things like throwing a javelin, throwing a cricket ball, um, a shoulder pass in netball or basketball. If you think about kicking, you would have learned to kick a ball. And again, think about football, or rugby ball, all of those different um, skills that actually transfer over. So on the screen, you'll see that at the top, it says that there is a definition and there's quite a few definitions in skill acquisition that we need to know. Um, and then the four different types of transfer that you'll need to know, positive, negative, proactive and bilateral. So positive is what I've just said, really, when one skill transfers really positively. So if you look at the, the, um, the in italics, um, positively to racket arm action of a tennis serve. OK, then you've got the opposite where actually one impedes the learning of another. So if you think about if you're a badminton player or a tennis player, how does your your wrist action in both? Does one actually contradict the other? Yes, it does. And how does that impact on your learning? Proactive um, is when newly learned skills influence skills already learned. So if you think about the example there, uh, a goalkeeper in football changing to play rugby union may have learned how to jump in the line. So if you're jumping up high um, when you're learning to jump in the line in rugby and then you go back to being a goalkeeper, actually those two skills are very, very similar. So they will have a positive impact. And then bilateral. Ideally, sports like um, basketball in particular, rugby, football, you should be able to do things on one side of the body as well as on the other. So if you think about basketball layup, if any of you have been watching um, last night with Michael Jordan and all of those players, they can just, without even thinking, lay up on the right-hand side of the body and the left-hand side, side of the body. And they don't have to think, oh, right, now I'm on my left-hand side, I need to do this, this and this. They do it without thinking. And that's bilateral transfer. On the next slide is a link to a video. Um, I think we're literally just going to show you maybe a few seconds. But it's um, a really, really insightful video. It's quite old, it's an Adidas advert. It's David Beckham and Johnny Wilkinson. So you should definitely know who those two people are. And if you don't, then you need to find out. Definitely. That one, yeah, perfect. Okay, I'll just show you a quick clip of it. Maybe if I just talk over the top. So essentially, it's just a video of the pair of them. And Johnny Wilkinson is one of the best rugby players that's ever existed. David Beckham, one of the best footballers that's ever existed. Both very iconic players. Um, and what they're doing is essentially practicing each other's skills. So David Beckham, as you can see, he's doing um, place kicking, free kicks. And then Johnny Wilkinson in a second will do the same. And then what they do is they move over to do uh, place kicking in rugby. So Johnny starts and he sort of talks through his technique and then David Beckham does it. And it's the idea that actually it's just kicking a ball, isn't it? However, the ball is shaped differently. There's a slightly different technique. Obviously, with a rugby player, you want to get it over the crossbar. With a footballer, you want to get it under the crossbar. And they just look at actually how, what they thought they might both be good at. One of them is very good at both, and one of them is less good. And it's just quite interesting, I think, for you to, to watch. And then what I want you to do is analyse this. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, and the next slide, your task links into this video. So you might want to watch it just once just to see it. And then you might want to watch it again. Um, and it's, it just says what it is. And they're practicing the kicking techniques, firstly with a football, then a rugby ball. And then I'd like you to answer the following question. So maybe put the question at the top of your page. I want you to discuss how Johnny Wilkinson um, is able to kick a football just as successfully as David Beckham, despite training and practicing for hours with a rugby ball. Now, deliberately done it that way around and when you watch the video it will make sense um you can probably guess johnny milkinson is very good at both whereas david beckham is not so good at the rugby but i want you to look at those four transfers of learning and include those in your uh, in your discussion and your analysis no more than one side of a4 but actually explain using those four how johnny is able to do both despite only practicing for hours and hours and hours with, with a rugby ball. So just have a go and, and um, I'll have a look, I'll see when it's done. And then your summer task, 
There we go. So I now want you to consider um, how good you are essentially at transferring skills. So choose two sports that you would consider as your best. So ideally one of them will be the sport you're going to use for A-level and then perhaps another one. They can be completely different or they might be quite similar, really doesn't matter. And you're going to analyse how transfer of skill learning has impacted upon your own performance in each. So there's a few little questions to help you. Are your two sports quite similar? For, exa for example, netball and basketball, they're quite similar. Um, or are they very different? Are you doing something like uh, swimming and rugby, for example? Um, then explain any skills that require similar execution. So like the example we've just seen, kicking in football and kicking in rugby. And then highlight any skills that have a negative influence on one another. So how do you control this? So are you a badminton player who also plays tennis? And do you have a problem with your grip or the way that you play because you've got a lot of negative transfer? Even netball basketball, if you play netball, you'll know that you have um, a restriction with your footwork, whereas basketball is very different. So do you play netball like a basketball player and basketball like a netballer? Does that have a positive or negative impact on your game? Um, I want you to make reference to each transfer of skill and include relevant examples throughout. So lots of different examples. Just keep talking about yourself and your own experiences with that. Um, and that, again, should just be a minimum of one side of A4. OK, so try and think about it. It really doesn't matter what two sports you choose. You might, you know, you might decide that you can do two very similar to make it easier for yourself or two very different. Um, totally up to you. But I'll look forward to reading that. On to the third and final component of the theory course, um, and that's physiology, which I'll be teaching you for five hours of a fortnight. And the reason I'm teaching you for five hours of a fortnight, just for one uh, module, is that it's actually 42% of the course. And it's a two-hour two hour exam at the end of the course as well. So it's quite a significant proportion of your entire grade. So at GCSE, you will have covered the heart in quite a lot of detail. You will hopefully know um, some key structures within the heart, and you will also know the uh, journey of the red blood cells through the heart. So there's just a few key terms up there to remind you from GCSE. Like Mrs Wilkes said with her modules, it may well be you just want to revisit your GCSE notes uh, before you start looking into detail with this. So as we know, the blood pumps through the heart and we know the journey but what we're going to look at today is we're going to actually look at how that happens it's not by magic your heart actually makes that blood flow through it and that is related to the conduction system of the heart now your heart is known to be myogenic what myogenic means is it creates its own electrical impulse now your heart is amazing that it can do it right now while you're sitting there while you're listening to me your heart is sending out an electrical impulse to make the walls contract, to push the blood through, to enable your blood to move around your body, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, there is your heart, you may well know from GCSE that your heart is made of cardiac muscle. Okay, and there is a particular area in your cardiac muscle, you can see it in the, in the picture, top, uh, top left hand side, or right as, as we refer to it, um, is your SA node, your sinoatrial node. This is your pacemaker. Okay, for anyone that knows, anyone that's had a pacemaker inserted into their heart, okay, this is your natural pacemaker. And when your natural pacemaker doesn't work, that's when you need a mechanical pacemaker. So the SA node, as it's referred to, is in that corner of that right atrium. Okay, and what it does is it sends out an electrical impulse to the atria walls, the two atria, the right atrium and the left atrium, and it makes them contract. So that electrical impulse makes the atria contract. And because they contract, they squeeze, a bit like a ketchup bottle, okay? When it contracts, it squeezes. And by it squeezing, it pushes the blood out of the atria, through the valves, into the ventricle. Um, the SA node does not impact the ventricle. It only impacts the atria. However, there is a second node, and that second node is called the atrioventricular node, or the AV node. And again, if you look on that right-hand side diagram, you can see the AV node that is positioned in the septum, 
the bit that divides the right and the left hand side, just at the bottom of the atria, at the top of the ventricles, you can see that AV node. So that AV node picks up the electrical impulse from the SA node. Okay, and then what that, what that AV node does is it sends the electrical impulse on further, but it sends it down some really weird words. It sends it down the bundle of his, bundle of his into the Purkinje fibers. Okay, strange words, but what that means is the AV node is sending it down. If we have a look on that diagram, there's almost like it goes straight down to uh, thick black lines going straight down the sector. That is the bundle of his. They're um, annotated the left bundle branch and left bundle branch, uh, right bundle branch on your diagram. That then divides into the kinji fibers. Now I always relate that to a tree trunk and then roots at the bottom of it. And at the end of those roots, the electrical impulse comes out of them and makes the ventricles contract. So in short, the SA node makes the atria contract and the AV node makes the ventricles contract. Now I'm just going to show you a quick, uh, hopefully I can do this, a quick explanation again. So just again, something just going through it in slightly different words to me. Very very short explanation. So if we can see, we've got the SA node firing, and then we've got the AV node firing. And they fire just after each other. So the atrium contracts, the blood gets pushed through. The ventricles contract, the blood gets pushed out. So there are loads of I'll just talk about, sorry. there are loads and loads and loads of examples of that online that you can easily have a look at and go through if you're at all confused at the moment. Okay, so I just want to go through it one more time. Stage one, the SA node sends the impulse to make the atrial ward contract. Stage two, the AV node picks up that impulse. Stage three, the AV node sends the impulse down the bundle of his. Stage four, that impulse divides then into the Purkinje fibers. Stage five, it comes out of the end of the Purkinje fibers and makes the ventricles contract. So the overall effect of the SA node and AV node are the atria contracting followed by the ventricles contracting. If you relate that to your journey of your red blood cell from G to C, hopefully that starts to make sense of how that works. Your session task. So the pace at which your SA node fires dictates your heart rate. If the SA node is quick, your heart rate is quick. If the SA node fires slowly, your heart rate is slow. Right now, your SA node is firing quite slowly, probably around about 72 times a minute, maybe a little bit slower, because hopefully you're quite fit. Um, once you start doing exercise, that SA node firing will increase, which will mean your heart rate increases as well. A simple session task for you based on what we've just been learning, and it's quite similar to probably what you've done at GCSE before. I would like you to complete five, um, five different um, activities. Okay, one of them is just lying down. One is just standing up. So you're gonna do each of the five, and you're gonna record your heart rate at the end of the time period that I've written down. And then all you're gonna do, very simply, is create a bar chart with your results that should show some comparative data. You can do that on a computer quite simply using Excel if you know how to do bar charts from that, or if you don't want to, you can just do it on paper, but probably uh, on Excel would probably be the easiest. That's really, really simple. Obviously, make it look nice and neat with a title, etc. but quite a simple task for your session task. A harder task for your summer task. Your summer task is to research the cardiac cycle. Now, the cardiac cycle has three phases. Diastole, atrial systole and ventricular systole. You might hear it referred to as diastole and systole, that's the American way, um, but we're looking at diastole, atrial systole and ventricular systole. 
I would like you to research what happens in each of these phases and how long do each of these phases take when you've got a normal resting heart rate. But the tough bit is, I want you to link the conduction system and the cardiac cycle together. A tip for you, the conduction system makes the cardiac cycle happen. Without the conduction system, the cardiac cycle does not happen. Um, if you could do two, no more than two pages of A4, please, putting everything together, that would be fabulous. It's quite a hard task, but I'm sure you're up to it. So, um, so far then, we've gone through the three modules with you. Uh, we've given you a little bit of information. We've given you a task based on um, what we've spoken to about today. And we've also given you a summer task for each as well. Um, but I, hopefully some of you are thinking, well, what more can I do throughout the summer to make sure that I'm ready? Um, point one, train as much as possible under the current circumstances that you can in your sport. So as soon as you're allowed back to competitive sport, you are absolutely ready or as ready as you can be to start uh, performing to a really, really high level. And um, if you are lucky in your sport in that you are able to start to do anything competitive before September 2020, unlikely, but some of you might, might be able to do that, make sure you do it and make sure you film it and keep a log of it. You're going to keep a log of every single competitive experience you have over the next year and a half. Um, I would strongly suggest you should revisit your GCSE notes. The GCSE course is really strongly linked with the A-level course. It's a really good basis. So it may well be because you haven't had to do that GCSE exam at the end of it. It may well be for the past few months you haven't really been looking at it, and I wouldn't blame you. Um, but um, it is really important to kind of have a really good grasp of it as you come in September. So just revise over it and make sure it makes sense. Um, there are loads of online resources that you can refer to um, as well. There's a really good um, resource called studyalevelp.co.uk that you can refer to. And there's lots of others out there that you might want to start to look at. Um, and, and what other subject do you get to watch, uh, watch films? And that is what I'm going to suggest to you. Um, there are some amazing films out there and documentaries. And when I say documentaries, they're not the boring old-fashioned things that have got no relevance to you and you're not interested in. Um, they are actually fascinating, some of these things. Um, a lot of these films and documentaries are really, really strongly related to the course. So I would strongly recommend that you watch them. Um, there's some amazing ones out there. That, again, they're not old films. They're blockbuster movies that have been out in recent years. And hopefully they will, be, they will become some of your very, very uh, favourite films. I know they're some of mine. And we've got a second page as well of some more, as well, uh, of, some more of them. A uh, personal favourite of mine is probably um, Icarus. Icarus is a film documentary, quite heavy going for about the first 15 minutes. If you get into the first 15 minutes, it's amazing. It's about a guy that was trying to test um, the effect of a drug uh, on his endurance performance. And um, while he was researching it, he became friends with uh, the head of Russian anti-doping. Um, and he was friends with him at the very time that the whole world found out that Russia were um, state sponsoring um, all of their athletes and to dope, which is why they're still banned from world competitions. It's absolutely amazing. Um, the Andy Murray documentary is really good as well in that it literally talks through every single second from the moment he gets really bad injured in his hip through until about a year ago. Um, he literally just uses his phone like late at night when he's thinking about it, crying. It's, it's really quite sad. And some of the films are amazing as well. I absolutely love Coach Carter. Sorry, just to go oh, back. Coach Carter's amazing. I love it. I love all of the films. I love all of them. <laughs> yeah, some really, really inspiring films as well, I would say. Um, yeah, brilliant. Probably my favourite one actually is Race, the film Race, uh, which is all about Jesse Owens uh, yeah. and, um, in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Absolutely amazing. Love it. Okay. Um, what will you need to have done before your first lesson then? So um, you will need to have completed your three session tasks that we've gone through with you. You will also need to have uh, completed your three summer tasks that we've gone through with you as well. Um, remember, we're going to take in these tasks and whether it's deliberate or not, these are going to formulate the basis of our first impression of you um, in terms of your work ethic. Those of you that we've known for five years, we haven't seen you in an academic context. Um, we haven't taught you GCSE PE either of us, so we have no idea what you're like in the classroom or where you're doing sport, apart from perhaps 
you know, the great that you've got a GCPPE. Um, we don't know much about you, so this is your opportunity to show us yourself in that different light. For those of you that are new to the school, obviously it's our very first impression of you. So really make sure you take pride in your work and that when you hand it in to us, you are, you are proud of what you've done. And it's a really, really good um, idea of what you're about. Um, also come with a really positive attitude and a smile. I think if you speak to any of the uh, students, older students at the school or students that have left the school that have done A-level tea with us, they find it a really, truly fun, positive experience. But it can only be that if you give something back to us. Um, hopefully us speaking to you now is kind of giving you a bit of a gauge of how we're gonna how we're gonna talk to you, how we're gonna engage with you through those lessons. We need you to engage back with us. That's what makes it uh, more interesting, that's what makes it more fun. Um, a smile is very, very, very important. Um, we've put our email addresses on uh, this slide as well. Um, obviously during the summer holidays we're not going to be on it every day, but we will check maybe once a week or so just in case there's anything you're really struggling with. Or if there's any questions you've got at all, really, if there's any worries before September, we'll, we will definitely reply to you. Um, so we're really looking forward to seeing you in September. Hopefully, after such a long time off, this has made you smile a little bit and made you a little bit excited about getting back to learning, getting back to school life, because um, we can't wait to see you. Um, As we always say, love us later. Mm -hmm. See you later, guys. Bye.